Good afternoon. Um, have you ever wondered what is the sound of the universe? What does the universe sound? This is something that in the gravitational wave business we have tried to find out over the last decade, decades, and since a few years we are actually there to hear the first few notes of the symphony of the universe. And as Professor Barry said, really kind of looking back uh, further out in the universe, but when you look further out, also you go back in history of the universe, like in a history book, to kind of turning the pages over uh, until you actually reach, hopefully at some point, the Big Bang and really discover what happened there. Um, what we will do over the next few years, uh, or next decades, is to build up a new class of gravitational wave detectors uh, that uh, Barry already mentioned. Um, and one of this will be the Einstein telescope. And I put here a picture on, on the left-hand side, you see the current detectors, LIGO, Virgo, uh, and then on the right-hand side, there's the Einstein telescope. And I think it's quite obvious if you think about it, what's the difference between these two. The two most striking differences you see here are the geometry, you go from L-shaped gravitational wave detectors to triangles, and that really has to do with the fact that while the current detectors were built to show that gravitational waves really exist, now that we are confident and have heard the first ones and seen them, that we want to build observatories which are really optimized for seeing all different kinds of gravitational wave uh, phenomena. And if you go for this triangular shape, um, you can cover uh, the whole uh, sky and you eliminate a few blind spots that we have in the current detectors. The other striking feature is that these detectors will be underground. And you see here for the Einstein telescope, it's probably located about a few hundred meters down. And the question is, why do we do this? Um, and the reason is, as everything in our business, is noise. So we make noise, small earthquake makes noise, and what you see here in the simulation is uh, it's a square kilometer uh, on the x and y axis, and on the y axis you see the depths, and the color tells you where do you have what seismic excitation, and you see the nice thing about the seismic waves is they mainly stay at the surface. So by going further down uh, into underground location, we make our environment more quiet, and actually the environment which pulls via gravity on our mirrors, pushes them around and creates fake uh, gravitational wave signals, we can eliminate and get a better sensitivity, in particular for the kind of for the bus, for the, for the low tone uh, signals, uh, the low notes uh, of our symphony. So why do we talk about this here at Maastricht? Uh, obviously here, uh, you might have heard about it, we are quite keen and we think this is an ideal location for building the Einstein telescope. And this has to do obviously with the environment. We have seen kind of the universities here, high profile universities. We have lots of high technology uh, uh, industry here, institutions around here. But one of the other factors which we have explored over the last few years is the local geology. So what you have in the southern Limburg region is, and this we found out via, via studies, uh, where we were kind of actively shaking the ground and then looking with seismometers, also drilling down to confirm this. What we found is that in the Limburg region, you have a soft soil top layer of kind of 50 to 100 meters, and underneath you have hard rock. So what does it mean? The soft soil is kind of a lossy material, so if I shake, if I make noise at the top, then it's first of all absorbed quite heavily in the top layers, but then also if I have my instrument, the Einstein telescope in the hard rock, my seismic waves come down and they get actually reflected off at the boundary from the soft soil to the hard rock, and that makes it uh, an ideal location where even if you think about future proving, if you would increase the noise, you know, would have more people, more mobility above here, uh, then still we would hope we get a decent attenuation factor. And that's why we are so keen, actually, to put ET forward here at uh, the Eurigio. So, um, we are not there yet with the Einstein telescope. We are working on roadmaps. It's on the European roadmap for uh, astronomy and astroparticles. We want to get on the S3 roadmap uh, this year, this uh, uh, European research infrastructure roadmap. And then in 2022, I think there will be a decision on where to build the Einstein telescope. There are currently two candidates. Uh, one is uh, in Sardinia, um, uh, supported by an Italian uh, consortium. 
And then we have the efforts here in the region, uh, led by the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany, putting forward the southern Limburg region. So there will be a little bit more patience required uh, to, until we know where we actually build it. But for everybody who is very keen on getting their hands dirty and building laser interferometers and beating our noise down, there's some good news because ET Pathfinder, which is a prototype facility for the Einstein telescope, will come to Maastricht and we will start putting that together over the coming months. You see here uh, an illustration. It will be actually built uh, not far from here. I'm also very happy it's kind of, I think, 500 meters away from where the uh, uh, Maastricht Treaty was signed. So a big European project, just the stone's throw away uh, from where the original treaty was made. I think that's a very nice thing. And it's funded uh, by uh, the Flandre and Netherlands Interreg. So it's a European project. This is what it will look like, a little bit of a sketch. And you see here, um, it doesn't really look like ET initially. And that is because out of these 10 kilometer triangular uh, laser interferometer arms, we took away 9,990 meters. And we are left over with uh, fairly short arms, 10 meters. But where the mirrors are, where all of the technology sits, there actually uh, we can test uh, uh, all of the ET technologies. And this will be really kind of uh, super low noise. What will be the different technologies we really want to demonstrate here? Uh, and Barry mentioned already some of the key ones. So the first one is really you want to get down, uh, you have this kind of, you want to have this measurement getting better to measuring a thousandth of a proton diameter. So, I mean, if you think about it, it's mind boggling and there's quite a lot of interesting physics in there. And one of the limitations is really your 10 to the 23 atoms and molecules in your mirror surface wobbling around with Brownian motion. And the one way to reduce this noise is by cooling it down. Okay, so we want to go to minus 260 uh, degrees Celsius there uh, with these mirrors. And this is a very particular challenge now. Barry was talking about all the ways of making our mirrors quiet, and now we say, oh, we put a cooling apparatus next to it. If you put your hand on your fridge or your freezer, you will feel vibrations, so that tells you already what a challenge that will be to develop the technology to keep this quiet. The next thing we have to then tackle in terms of technology, and again, there's lots of uh, synergies with, uh, with uh, chip uh, producers, uh, microchip technology, is that glass is not very good, what we currently use for our mirrors, at low temperatures, and we have to go to silicon technology. Uh, a very nice step, but from the physics point of view, it's very different. Glass is an amorphous material where all of the atoms and molecules are kind of in a random order. Now you go to a crystalline material, so all different kind of opportunities uh, and benefits there, but also some challenges. And then on top of this, if you go for a different material, if you hold up a glass mirror and a silicon wafer, through one you can look through, through the other not, so you see there are different optical properties of these two materials. We also have to change our laser uh, frequency and all the laser technology we developed over the last 40 years, you know, we throw overboard and have to start from, from zero again. The fourth component of all of this will be uh, that these detectors are currently so sensitive already that we are limited by our measurement ability itself. That's the so-called Heisenberg uncertainty. So quantum mechanics limits us on how accurately we can do this measurement. And there we have some uh, interesting tricks that we want to test. And these four technologies are a huge program put together. Uh, and that will be a unique research facility we have here. Uh, and we are uniquely placed uh, to do this research and combine these four different technologies to see how we get the improvement of sensitivity for the Einstein telescope. All of this is obviously not done by a small group of people, but it's rather a large group of people. It's a very collaborative effort. I put here in a list of the uh, 14 uh, partners in ET Pathfinder. You see lots of universities from the Netherlands, uh, from Belgium, uh, uh, from Germany, research institutes, and so on. So it's a, a very nice program. And we have, in addition to the formal members, there's quite a lot of interest from around Europe, from Australia, uh, where people have already joined the effort uh, uh, helping us building this. We have a uh, investment, a capital investment of 14 and a half million uh, and a decent manpower to do this. And one of the most interesting aspects obviously will be coming back to the discussions we had in the morning, what is the societal impact, is there's quite a big interest from 
industry, as I said already, semiconductor industry, chip production. Uh, there are partners who are keen to see how far we can push the cryogenic silicon technology. And we had last month in Antwerp the first meeting of our industrial advisory board, and there were about 80, 80 members there, and also the Flemish science minister was kind of kicking uh, this effort off. So this is what will happen right now. As I said, you don't need to be patient until 2022. Uh, you can sign up right now for helping us with all of this. And I hope what we will do here is really kind of establish Maastricht University and our partner NICEF as one of the world leading uh, uh, entities in gravitational wave science, obviously continuing at the core the success story of gravitational wave discoveries, uh, astrophysics, cosmology, and fundamental science in the core. But around this, obviously, we do the technology development the uh, engagement with industry, and then one thing that is for me personally quite important is it's obviously we are not doing this all for us, but we are enthusing hopefully some members of the public and then training the next generation of scientists who might do either fundamental research or build your next uh, self-steering car or your next type of computer. So with that, I hope we all uh, can together uh, enjoy over the next decades to listen to the symphony of the universe. Thank you.